Um, now, this is my style. I'm going to give an elementary talk that is accessible to everybody. Chalk talk, it's not for experts. It will be right at the end, mentioning some recent results of myself and Zahiri and Heather Kavlik, Wang Peng. But most of what I want to do is try and introduce you to this area, this, this subject I like very much. And um, I want I want you to ask the question throughout. It's uh, it's meant to be inclusive for everybody. Um, my collaborators. So I love making life an excellent way to do good research, and that is to work with great people. <laughs> it doesn't get much better than these guys. So, so yeah, you know. Wang Peng is in Worcester Polytechnic, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and Xavier in Toulouse. And when you get new results, uh, all new results I talk about, which involve me, involve these guys. Okay, so let us start with a very elementary question. Let's start talking about differential inclusions. I'll talk about differential inclusions for about 10 minutes. Then I'll make a discontinuous jump and I'll start to talk about the Avedis Giga functional and then we'll connect them a little bit later. So I'm going to ask a very elementary question about differential inclusion. So this is our question. So suppose we have U along the P into R2. We're going to do everything from R2 to R2. We have a set and initially J between two by two, and if we have that the gradient along the K or whatever the question is, does this imply additional regularity of the gradient just from the fact of this differential inclusion? So does this imply that the gradient is smooth? So why would we expect this in any sense? Well, here's an example. If we take K to be the four matrices, which are a set of lambda times rotations, then this differential inclusion and asks. If we look at what this means, this means U1 X equals to Y <coughs> U. One y minus two x. I think I should have got some water. Do this. <laughs> <laughs> Where have you seen that before? <laughs> so, if we, instead of talking about a derivative that existed almost everywhere. We talked about a derivative that literally existed everywhere. It's exactly the cauchy riemann equations. We have that the solutions are analytic. This is next <coughs> analysis, right? And you might say, okay, well, we have a different hypothesis, but you know, the same thing can be easily made to work. We have this standard identity. You can take the divergence of the cofactor of a gradient that is equal to zero in a distributional sense, right? And if the gradient happens to belong to Formal matrices that maybe in algebra, the cofactor is equal to the gradient itself. So we have the divergence of well, the cofactor is the same as the divergence of the gradient. When I say divergence of this two by two matrix, I mean divergence of each row, right? So that means that the divergence of the first, the gradient of the first coordinate is equal to zero in the distributional sense, divergence of of the second, the gradient of the second one equals zero in distributional sense by Wales lemma, it's all linked, right? So in this case, we get an instant dramatic improvement just from the differential inclusion. No? Yeah? All right, so let's talk about when this fails to be true. Daniel already talked about this, but let's do it a little bit more slowly if you haven't seen this before. So we say, K has an R1 connection, rank one connection. 
You can only use. There exists a b belong to k such that the rank of a minus b is equal to one, where of course a is not equal to b. Okay. So if we had this, then when two by two, this is equivalent to there exists a v, it could be a unit vector such that a of v equals b of v, right? So let's say the following thing. Let's take a square with one side parallel to V, the other side parallel to the orthogonal complement. And let's cut it up into some strips. And let's put A here, and then B here, and then A here. Okay? So for sure, we can have a function taking the affine gradient A here. Okay? This condition means that we can also have a function taking gradient B here, and it will be continuous along this interface. And that's not too hard to see. You can make it agree at this point. And the fundamental theorem of calculus integrating along this direction, both coordinates will agree all the way through, right? So we can build a Lipschitz function taking these gradients, right? It exists du belonging to these two gradients, and this thing will jump. The gradient will jump from A to B to A again. No? So if there exists two matrices inside your set, which has a Frank one connection, there's no possible improvement of regularity. No? Cool. So we've seen an example where it happens, we've seen where it can't possibly happen. I'm going to stay fairly general term. Um, 93, nice fact. Suppose. K is the connected submanifold into right two. No right one connections. And it's elliptic. In a sense, I'll say in a second. Then Define inclusion, say U belongs to W1P, and then up to U belongs to K, or everywhere. This implies that the gradient is smooth, where smooth means basically as smooth as the submatter. Okay. So, what does elliptic mean? Elliptic. means that if A belongs to K, let U of A be the tangent space to K at A, then the tangent space does not have any rank or connections. So not only does the set have no real connections, but if you take the tangent space at any point, that thing also has no real connections. Okay? It's a stronger property. If you have that in the case, then you have this dramatic improvement of regularity. This is an example of that. Okay, So this is, believe it or not, the most general theorem we have. This is a very classical subject. There isn't that much known in the positive direction. There's an awful lot of interesting stuff in the, well, I won't say negative direction, because these are very interesting and powerful theorems, but improvement the regularity from differential inclusions, this is one of the most, the most general theorem. Okay, so that is differential inclusions. Okay, now we're going to make the discontinuous jump. I'm going to talk about the Vitas Giga, which has already mentioned, and the Goes really good. Uh, all right, so we are going to set this function We are going to minimize over 
we want to throw an omega, we stay value functions, we can put a second order boundary condition uh, if we want to. Let's not go into this right yet. I have this one piece of excellent Japanese chalk and it's uh, almost done. <laughs> so I'm gonna have to press hard with the uh, little toilet and stuff. All right, so so they build this giga functional. There's, a, there's a book of wishes and uh, <laughs> outside there. Uh, okay. <laughs> stuff that costs whatever, like fifty dollars a month. I just found the piece and uh, like the other day, and I just took it. And <laughs> Like someone specifically brought this and I stole your, your fancy Japanese chalk. So whoever did this, uh, <laughs> 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 you have another piece, uh, so I'll give you $20. <laughs> 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 All right. So why is this interesting? Well, this is interesting for a lot of physical reasons. Uh, uh, mathematically, if we look at Yang Tan or Motola, this. Then we're W. Oops, of course, like this. We have a value with some integral condition. This. Then what is this? This is modeling oil and water, right? So I want to be plus one and then minus one. And this guy, when you want to take epsilon down to zero, you can characterize the limiting minimization problem. So probably everybody here has heard of gamma convergence. Perhaps everybody knows what it means. If you don't, then talk with me afterwards. I don't have time to go into it, but it's the most natural way to extract the limiting minimization problems from a sequence of parameterized problems. The <clears throat> gamma convergence problem for this functional is well understood from the 70s. The gamma convergence to a limit like this, which is just h n minus one measure of the jump insect this and the minimizing function space is W belonging to SVB of omega uh, plus one minus one like this. And this is, I think, and many times here might correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is the first really non trivial example of gamma convergence. And uh, this is a very, very important theorem. Generated a huge amount of subsequent work. Well, it, it's very nice, but one thing it lacks is the surprise factor because <laughs> if you look at this thing here, then you can bound this by this. Like this. And where the W wants to transition, I think it's this way here, where W transitions from plus one to minus one, this is of order one, and it's just the L1 norm of the gradient, so it's not that surprising, it converges just to the perimeter of the jump. You know? What is great about this thing is that the limiting minimization problem is not something you initially expect, it's not just counting things. Huh? Maybe put a two on the upper. Functional also a square is a square. Yeah, thank you. So this guy does not have something as 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 easily guessable as its gamma convergence limit. And furthermore, if you take a sequence of finite energy, and this is absolutely a key point, that sequence does not have to convert to something which is inside BV, right? So this thing, again, it's not a surprise that the limiting functions will be in BV because we're constraining the gradient to order one, basically. Yeah? That's not what happens here. And uh, when I talk about this thing alone, that's the first thing I want to talk about, why you have a sequence of finite energy, which does not going to count jumps to the power one, it's counted in the power three, and, for that reason, you can create examples where if you sum little jumps of power three, it's finite, but if you sum to the power one, it blows up, and therefore the limit doesn't have to be in BV. So let's write that down, maybe here. So there it is. End of the good chalk, beginning of the bad chalk. Hey, All right, so if we have 
that's okay. That's a zero, and we have supremely okay. I ask you all that. Okay, that's infinity. It's a very non well, it's a non trivial theorem, but it is nevertheless a theorem that we can extract the sequence whose gradients will converge strongly. So we can have the gradients of UK will converge in L3. This is down to these pair of teams to some function where you run over to W13, but gradient of this does not have to belong to BV. Okay. So there isn't uh, any obvious structure of the gradient to play with. In this case, when the function in BV, we know exactly how the thing is going to jump. It's, it's a very well understood function class. In this case, no. Um, so if you want to create the gamma convergence conjecture, you have to come up with the right function space and the right energy functional, and you can't just inherit stuff from the BV functions. This is where it starts to be a lot more interesting and also a lot harder. And to make progress with this, the uh, early founders of this subject, which are uh, these guys, I'm probably with Delenis Mantegat. I think this is Delenis' first ever paper, even. Um, Simone Cohen will go a little bit later, or um, not much later. They used concepts from scalar conservation laws called entropies. And if you did your first year PD course, no doubt you remember entropies, but Perhaps you've forgotten it. I'm going to briefly talk about it, see what it actually says and how we can use it for this problem. All right, so another discontinuous job we're talk about is entropies. So if you have no scalar conservation law, distributionally in say R plus plus R, like this. There are many weak solutions of this for the same kind of construction with the lamina. <coughs> you will extract a reasonable notion of weak solution of this. So here's something you can do, or what you actually do do. You take the yeah. following yeah. pair of functions. By theta, where you actually have the following identity. You have this is called an X. And then we have that by prime and prime is equal to theta prime. This is called an entropy entropy flux pair. So if you have a smooth solution of this guy, so if you do if it's smooth solution of star, then if we take the divergence in the center of say by the Theta of u, where divergence means the part of the second t on the first chord and the part of the second x on the second. Let's see what happens. I'm going to have pi prime of u, u of t, theta prime of u, u of x. But if we have a smooth solution of this thing, then we know that u of t plus f prime of u, u of x is equal to zero. So therefore, u of t is minus f prime of u, u of x. So this thing is time here. So we have minus pi prime of u. F prime of u, u of x plus pi prime of u, u of x. We factor out the u of x, and we have from this identity that this thing is equal to zero if we have a smooth solution, right? It's an additional equation that smooth solutions satisfy. Yeah? Cool. So, why do we care about that? Well, what these guys in this subject do think, is they regularize in this way. Like this. And if you have a bounded sequence, you can pass to a limit weekly and with some consequences of the algebra of this stuff, this weak limit will satisfy the following thing that divergence of phi of u, even of u, is a positive measure. For all Flux pairs and three and three flux pairs of so pairs that satisfy this thing. Star star. Okay. Cool. And this is the notion of weak solution that these guys define. Um, 
there exist such things because we can't extract the limit. There are, there are, there are you that, that, that for which this is true. And those guys have all the nice things you might want. The solution U is it's BV, it's niche, it is, it is, it is as nice as you could possibly want. This is extremely successful theory of weak, of, of a weak solution of a PDE. And uh, perhaps one of the most, most successful examples of, of, of weak solutions in nonlinear PDE. Cool. So in the early days of Divina Sigo, I mean there's a natural, there's a natural, there's a natural relation between these two guys, which I'll tell you later if you want. Uh, the, 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 the early pioneers of the subject wanted to copy some of this, this technology. So first thing to say is because of because of the connection to micromagnetics, it's now more typical not to deal with not to deal with curl-free vector fields, but with divergence-free. So we're going to talk about M, which is the rotation of the gradient. And these guys will be the guys that are the limit of a sequence like this of finite Adidas limit as k goes infinity by epsilon uk is that infinity from passing to a subsequence, there is a strong limit. And we extract this m here. So m is a mapping. From uh, WM is S1, and the equivalent of M is equal to zero, it's the solution of the Eichmann equation. Okay? And it turns out that if you define the following class, P on T, which is the set of mappings from S1 into R2. That satisfy the following thing d by dt of pi of e to the it dot e to the it to be equal to zero, then advergence of pi of m is equal to oops, is a mega. Like this for all of the effects. Okay, this is mostly down to the second group DKMO. All right, so this is a function class that we're going to try and work with. So we know that we don't have the gradient of BV, so M is not BV. But as a substitute, we have this condition that whenever we have an entropy, we take the divergence of phi of M, that thing is a measure. And we hope to prove nice structural things about that class of solutions to the icon of the equation. <coughs> In fact, we hope that they are BV-like in structure. If they are BV-like in structure, then the gamma convergence conjecture follows essentially by standard techniques. Okay? So that is the use of entropies for the Vitas Giga. And that was one of the key tools to begin this process at all. So I mentioned that. It's non-trivial that if you have a sequence of finite of this bigger energy that the gradients converge strongly, it is indeed non-trivial uh, as oh, my functional. There we go. As we add up squared out to zero, the constraint on the second gradient vanishes. So there's no a priori reason the gradients will converge strongly, right? But nevertheless, you can show the gradients converge strongly. In fact, the most modern way to do this is to use spherics compactness theorem. Um, but that's uh, something else I'm not too deviated from. So with the tool of entropies, we can get compactness and we can get this limiting function class. We'll have the, the, this is the thing we want to try and study. And we would like to, like to prove really good structural properties of, of, those, of those M, so the actual equation with this additional thing that divergence of phi of m is, is, a, is a measure. What I'm going to call from now on an entropy solution of the Eichmann equation. Okay, so in a sense, the Vitas Giga, the study of the Vitas Giga functional is, 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 is part of the study of the Eichmann equation. What is the, what is the most natural weak class? What is the most natural weak class of solutions of the Eichmann equation? All right, so what theorems 
will prove. Well, one of the uh, early theorems, I've got to put this in my list of authors. So up here is the list of authors because they are one at the same time, but then I forgot to write some of the computers. So here's a theorem by Tatum. Um, and author. So if M goes from omega to F1, it is an entropy solution in this sense. Equal zero is yeah, is zero for all fine thing. Then M is rigid, which I'm going to abbreviate to rid dot in the following sense. If mu is a complex subset of our region omega, then the cardinality of the singular set of M intersects U is at most one. And if there is a singularity inside U, then what M does is just form a vortex around that singularity. Okay? So this function M is entirely defined by its singularities. Right? If you have a singularity, Inside your domain, so the complex set inside your domain containing the singularity, then all you have going on with M is just forming a vortex around it. Uh, right, a vortex, so. so a vortex like this, right? It's just mod x over x rotated. Okay. So why do they care about this? Well, part of the technology is that if you have your M which comes from a U, which is the limit of a sequence of, of, of finite abelian of energy. Then this measure is bounded above by constant of the limit of that sequence. I have one day of your sequence. So if you have a sequence with the ability to give that energy goes down to zero, then it will satisfy this condition that divergence of phi of m is zero on m. Okay. So they use this thing to characterize what functions you can obtain as limits of sequences of ability to energy goes down to zero. This is a result Xavier spoke about his beautiful theorem, recent theorem, doing an optimal quantitative generalization of this, of this statement. Okay. So um, what has this got to do with differential inclusion? Well, this is the collection. Several years ago, maybe seven years ago at this point, Wayne Payne was in Cincinnati with me, and we were working on a potential way to generalize this theorem. Uh, and we did the following things. So there is a pair of canonical entropies for the Jim Cohn entropies. These were the first entropies that we ever found. They are rather nice guys. This, these guys belong to EMT. They, they, if I wrote them down, you might not say that they're nice, but they are nice. They're polynomial functions uh, of their coordinates. Um, they, they, uh, they are, they are obviously analytic. They're, they're, they are, they are, they are. They are uh, they are good guys. These are the guys. <laughs> these are the first guys that were found. These are the guys that the brothers of the Lelis Mantegaz are used in the compactness proof. These are the guys that they that, they, that are necessary to formulate the gamma convergence conjecture. And um, what we wanted to do was replace this hypothesis of this vanishing for all entities with just the convergence of these two guys. Zero. Okay. And this thing is equivalent to, of course, having the curl of the rotated guy. So I'm going to write rotations now with i times these things. So in this subject, we tend to identify complex numbers with, with, uh, with several things, with rotations as well as with vectors, but I don't need to clear what this means. Right? So this is just this vector field rotated for k equal 1, 2. And if we assume we have a simply connected domain, 
which is equivalent to there exists some W on um, omega into R2, such that the gradient of W of X is equal to I times this thing, like this, and this is the second row, right? This implies this, like the equivalent. No? And what is this? Well, this is a different conclusion into the following set. It said, okay. Well, we define it this way. So K is equal to, I'm going to define P in a second, P e to the i theta, P that belongs to 0 to pi, where P of e to the i theta is the two by two matrix we get under this. Thanks. Right? So this thing, the gradient belongs to this set, so it solves the different conclusion almost everywhere. Yeah? Would you agree? Yeah. Cool. So what would be great would be if this different inclusion implied some regularity of W, or the gradient of W, because if it implied regularity of the gradient of W, because these are nice functions that would imply regularity over M, and then we start to be able to hope for something like the fragility result of R. And um, if this set K was, was a set which was without record connections and was elliptic, then Strax there would kick in, and this would actually be smooth. But if it was smooth, then M would be smooth, but M can't be smooth because you do have singular solution with a vortex. So can't be elliptic. On the other hand, if it didn't have, if it had a record connection, you'd have a whole line of singularities and there'd be no hope for this to be true either. No? It turns out that this set K has no record connections, but it's not elliptic. In fact, it's wildly non elliptic. At every single point, the tangent space is a rank one line. Okay. So, to get something out of this, you need to have a regularity theory for different inclusions into set of tangent rank one connections where it's not elliptic. Okay. And uh, if you read Strack's paper, and I recommend reading any paper of Strack's uh, very, very pretty things. You can see that there is a way to do that, or at least a way to get the ball going. Or the ball blowing, I should say. So, looking closely at Strauss' methods, it's not that hard. Um, what you can what you can conclude from this is that the gradient of W will have some fractional sum of regularity. It'll actually be in the Bessel space e one over three four infinity. I'm going to go like this. And when we saw this, we were very excited because it's a third of a gradient. And there's a beautiful theorem by the letters and Nick Nat that if you have a third of a gradient in a fractional Sobolov sense, then the solution is the icon equation of rigid. Okay. So we thought, okay, we're, we're really in business. We have a third of a gradient. It's not fractional Sobolov space, it's best of space, but, but it's actually a weaker space. And there's no way to, to actually apply the theorem. However, working by hand, translating this regularity into regularity of M, just fighting with it for a while, you can, you can get it from here. And that's what we did uh, back in 2018. And then we met up here, and um, we asked ourselves, what happens if we ask the more basic question? So if we just have that the gradient of W belongs to K almost everywhere, so in our theorem, we take a divergence free M, we create this different conclusion, we get regularity of the gradient, transfer it back to M and then work with M, okay? What if we don't do that? What if we just consider this as a problem just by itself? We have a function from R2 to R2, solves this different conclusion into the set K, okay? Can we get the same kind of rigidity for, the, for this function, for the gradient of, of W? And uh, that turns out to be somewhat harder. So this is the initial things you might like to do. You say, okay, if you belong to K, that means that W of X equals P of M of X for some M of X belongs to S1, just because that's how the set K is defined. So for every single 
every single die dot mu x is inside this set. So there's just some m of x that picks it up, right? And then what you might hope for, so hope that the divergence of m is equal to zero. Because if that works through, then the previous theorem takes in, right? And uh, after all, there's no reason why that should be true, but that's what we are ultimately able to show. So, so this is me, Xavier, and Wanyang, and I guess what, like 2019 maybe, 2020. Uh, this is the theorem. If we have this differential inclusion for the star, star, implies that W is rigid, which means that if you write, if you write the W just like this, then, then your M is something that just has vortices and some singularities and that's it. So those are the only things that can happen. You have this strange kind of regularity of this different inclusion into a non elliptic uh, one-dimensional set. And one of the things that uh, was kind of pleasant and surprising for me about this was that um, this elementary question, does this thing imply regularity, doesn't seem to have much linearity involved, but the heart of this proof in the end was, was to use a certain linear structure to conclude, to argue that if this wasn't true, then then, then the consequence would be that the, that the Hilbert transform would be a bounded operator from C0 into L1, which is not. So ultimately, this comes down to properties of Hilbert transforms. The first time I've ever had to deal with a Hilbert transform or where it multiplies in any sense. And we have to thank the referee for giving us a more direct way to prove it in this way. So this elementary question involves surprising, surprising, surprising methods in the end. And a lot of that comes down to some beautiful paper of Xavier and Francesco Girardi, who proved the following theorem. That if we have a sleeping eigenvalue operation, then if it's an eigenvalue, if it's an entropy solution, and the fact that these guys belong to the space of measures, or all entropies, this is equivalent to M belongs to B, one over three, three block infinity. And the way they did it was to develop a very, very, a very evolved way of constructing a large class of entropies. And that construction it's consent parameterized by scalar value functions and it was linear with respect to those scalar value functions. And that linearity ultimately is the linearity that, that resulted in this use of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Hilbert transform. So the proof is not something I have any hope to uh, reasonably give you an idea of, but, but, but what was satisfying is just, is just how, how different the methods were from the initial hypothesis. All right, so... Um, one of my main purposes for this talk is to try and generate more interest from the Vidis Giga. So the Vidis Giga was kind of dormant from 2000 to fairly recently. And uh, some diehards were working on it all that time. Um, uh, Radu Ignat, myself, and I don't know what I uh, no, no, And those are the only people I know. And then recently there's been a kind of burst of new activity new people got into the field with new ideas, Xavier, um, Anio Marconi, and there starts to be a lot of progress and, uh, and there's still a lot of open problems. And I think some very beautiful problems that are accessible, problems I care about a lot. And so I hope to interest some of you people in them. And that's what I would like to do in the final minutes. I'd like to tell you some problems I find interesting See if I can get into the 
I suppose you have the following hypothesis. I suppose you have the way numerical equation. And suppose your hypotheses are that the divergence of entropy is actually NLP for all entities. Okay. So the real thing which is lacking the Avidas Giga conjecture is an understanding of the non one dimensional part. There's a very strong paper by uh, Deleles and Otto that shows that for an entropy solution where these guys are in space measures, those measures have a one dimensional part where on the one dimensional part M behaves very well. It actually has traces, it jumps across the traces. All that stuff is exactly what we'd expect if M was being viewed. But what they don't know is about outside that one dimensional part. It could be a counterpart, even that's a continuous part. Nothing is known about that. So, techniques to understand the continuous part are lacking. So, suppose there are hypotheses we just have nothing but that's a continuous part. In fact, it's an LP. As a consequence of the Avedis Giga conjecture, the energy should concentrate on the one dimensional part. So, this, this thing should vanish if it's an LP. That's a consequence, it's a part of the Avedis Giga conjecture. And if, if these guys all vanished, then, then they would be rigid. Again, part of the Avedis Giga, well, actually, that's, oh, that's also a theorem. So, Avedis Giga conjecture says that if this is true, then they should all be zero, and therefore M should be rigid. Okay, so when someone solves these Avedis the Avedis Giga conjecture, that is what's going to happen. But that might be some time coming. So, what if we just work on this? Does this imply that M is rigid? And what is cool about this is that with a uh, uh, paper with me and Guayin, um, this hypothesis is equivalent to M belonging to E, one of the three, three P infinity, they lock infinity, omega. Oh for a certain range of p, p between one and four over two. So this says that if you have your solution of the Eichmann equation with this level of regularity, then this is true. And if the Avedis Giga conjecture is true, it means all these guys vanish and therefore it's rigid, which means that this level of regularity, solutions of the Eichmann equation are rigid. Okay. However, if you just take p equals one, that's exactly the space of entropy solutions, which are just limits of finite ability to energy, and they have line singularities. Huh? So you have this sharp cutoff. You have just point singularities, go to line singularities as you go from three to anything above three. Right? So this is what I meant by my previous comment when we saw this space in 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 your talk about uh, about your Euler equations, the one of the simplest nonlinear PDs you can have is the Eichmann equation, and uh, just one part of the Euler's Giga conjecture is to have an absolutely an absolutely settled answer as to what is the best of scale regularity that regularity Eichmann equation takes. In. So this is a problem I like. Another problem I like. You say we like. Uh, it would be great to have uh, a wider class of 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 of, of sets which are which are non-elliptic, have no connections, for which we have the same kind of regularity. In fact, there might be a theory out there. It might be uh, a new regularity theory for differential inclusions into such sets. So, if K is non-elliptic. No R1 connection. And even give yourself a one sub manifold. Thus, the difference between the W is going to K implies W is rigid. That would be great. That would be a lovely theorem to prove. And maybe there's techniques now to approach it. That's something else we're actively looking at. Third problem in uh, curve. Uh, yeah, I should say K is a one dimensional submanifold. 
and take it closed and connected. Thank you. Make the big difference. All right. But it would make sense also for two manifolds, right? For two dimensional ones. Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't because, uh, because uh, there's a paper by Zhang that if you have a, if these conditions are closed to the of some manifold, then it has manifold connection. So, so this is only for one. No. Well, let's let's talk about it. Yeah. yeah. No, I think the the answer is likely to be no. Ah, okay. No. But one thing, I think one thing is probably important. Okay. So what? So what's your what's your? You think? No, no. Let's let's right, right. let's 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 um, this was our original motivation. We thought that if we could do this different conclusion and prove rigidity, then what we'd like to do is loosen the condition, prove a kind of stability. What if we don't have something which is strictly inside this set, but it's close to the set? Would that mean that we are close to zero energy, energy configuration? A kind of presentable of James theorem for this particular uh, set. If we could do that, then various things about the basis theorem would come easier. Um, so let me state that one. So, so this is the Zeka James Muller theorem. So uh, Andre talked about various generalizations about this uh, already. This is a very another very attractive area that if we consider the infimum, uh, uh, so. Uh, Over R belonging to rotations of the interval of radius U minus R to the P dx. This is bounded by constant interval of the distance to the power P of the gradient away from the space of rotations. This is beautiful. This is a very well known theorem at this point. And it's done. This is what we call a stability result for different conclusions. So if you are just an LP sense close to the different conclusion, you actually force to be close to one particular. One particular matrix inside it. But implicit in this is that if you have an exact different conclusion to rotations, it is affine, right? Not true in our case, but what if, so is it true that, that the infimum over phi zero or phi such that d phi belongs to k? of n the ball of omega of w minus b phi. Let's do this to So we don't expect, we know it's not true that we have the same power p, power p scaling, <laughs> but maybe some root power is true, something like this. The distance of the gradient w away from the k, the power p, the x, to some alpha where alpha is less than one. It's something like this true. If it was true, that would help us with the beta's bigger uh, very, very much. And, um, and as far as I know, there aren't any stability results. We have non different conclusions. This would be a very new kind of theorem. And as a kind of way to start studying this, is uh, something we got over the summer. If we instead take K to be once a manifold. Contained within two by two, elliptic, no micron connections. No. Then this Muller theorem is actually true. It's an interval of A belonging to K into the Romita. Oh, subdomain the prime of. The u minus a the p dx is less than constant interval 
distance, it's distance two, it's this E through the U K, the X like this. So this for two by two is a is a whole generalization of Moore's theorem because in two by two, the, well, the set K is just rotations of one-dimensional cell manifold. Now we can take any one-dimensional closed boundaryless sub manifolds so are closed, connected, no boundary. And uh, so K is rotation, this is a special case. Um, and this is very clear. This is uh, a few months ago, and uh, it could be in the archive to be uploaded. In so, uh, this uh, is a true in high dimension. We can show that we have one sub manifold in 3 by 3, which invents, which has a path R squared, does not even make compactness. So, there's no hope of a very general theorem in, in outside of 2 by 2. But, uh, but there, I mean, as the sort of Monday's talk, there's a lot of room to generalize Muller's theorem in higher dimensions for special classes, another thing we like very much. Uh, so any of those problems you find interesting, talk to me, talk to Zabia, you'll be very happy with them. Right. Elasticity uh, is equivalent to the following thing, that if we have A, B belonging to K, then the determinant of A minus B controls from above A minus B squared. That's equivalent to having that the tangent space of the network like, connection is by doing a pen expansion. In our case, for our set K, we have a power of four, and that is when you work through Sir method, that's why you get a third the gradient thing. Yeah. And for, you know, obviously, for every analytic uh, set in that network connections, there'll be some power of this. This is of a quantitative version of having network connections. Right, so, so the original uh, sorry, the original uh, quite fast there. So, the original theorem by uh, Jabin, Otto, uh, 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 Jabin Patan Otto was that if you take the divergence of phi of M for every single entry, if it all vanishes, every single one of them, then we have rigidity. And what we wanted to do back in the day with Wai was replace that hypothesis with this having these two guys, uh, in two chain count. And uh, our set K, for those of you who are kind of, uh, experts into this, or not even experts, but just seeing this stuff before, if you think of those in conformal and conformal, then I'll say, okay, it's kind of like this. So this is the conformal, this is the anti-conformal, it's a kind of like a, 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 a spiral type thing. So it's rotating once in the conformal and three times in the anti-conformal. And uh, if you differentiate this, you see the size are the same, that's why we, we determine the zero for the time to find. And it's actually very natural kind of effect. It's right down if someone's actual. This is the Lamy theorem. This is why I want to use. I wonder if there's any hope to do this for this.